It's worthwhile to notice a couple of key trends in modern wireline links. The first is to bring dyes closer together, for example, within the same package and separated by only a couple of millimeters or even less. Such short links can have very little loss at Nyquist, which in turn improves signal integrity. It obviates the need for complex equalization, therefore. And in these cases, we generally don't require an A to D and DSP at the receiver. It's also easier for both, shies, uh, both dyes to, to share a common time reference and synchronize their clocking. Overall, the IO circuits can have very low power and the transceivers can be small in size. The links can have very high bandwidth density as a result. Moreover, since there's little or no DSP required in the transceivers, there's very little latency between the two chips, which is important for some applications. On the other hand, although there's low power overall, this approach puts large multi-chip systems onto the same package where there's a very high power density. This requires more resources for power delivery and cooling the chips in the package. Moreover, this approach relies on advanced packaging technologies, which in turn generally increases the cost of manufacturing and testing the whole system. And finally, these requirements for fancy package assembly and heat dissipation technologies can potentially impact the yield and reliability of such systems. Overall, however, the benefits of this approach are making it increasingly attractive for an important set of applications. Co-packaged die-to-die -die interfaces are becoming particularly important in several key applications. For example, where heterogeneous package level integration is desired. That is where we want to combine different semiconductor process technologies together in the same package. This is a picture where we've got multiple chiplets arranged side by side together in a package, each performing specialized functions uh, and each realized in different process technologies and interconnected with each other via die-to-die -die interfaces. Special case of that is when we want co-packaged memory and processor systems. The memory requires a different process technology. It doesn't consume a lot of power, but it's really critical that the links between memory and processor have low latency. So die to die interfaces are ideal for that. Uh, another important application for die to die interfaces is where we're trying to integrate together large systems and but the uh, overall area of the silicon is pushing up against the reticle limit. That is the maximum surface area of silicon that can be processed all in one step. So uh, examples of this are where we've got very large FPGAs, um, many, many core processors for either networking or AI applications. Again, here the idea is to have multiple chips on the same package communicating via these low latency, low power, and dense die-to-die -die interfaces. The second key trend actually goes in the exact opposite direction. It's where the dyes that need to communicate with each other are increasingly far apart. And this is being driven by increasingly large parallel compute data centers, cloud compute uh, installations, and also a architectural trend towards disaggregation, that is separating the functions of compute, memory, storage into separate equipment racks in order to make more efficient use of, of each piece of hardware. So these trends are giving rise to the exact opposite challenges to what we saw with co-packaged die-to-die interfaces. Now, because the dies are far apart, signal integrity becomes very challenging. And overall power of the system is very, very high because you, you need all that equalization to combat the signal integrity challenges. So there's a few different technologies for interconnecting chips that are separated on different boards. The lowest cost one is direct attached cabling. That is where the chips are attached to a conventional printed circuit board and also attached to the circuit board are connectors to passive copper cables. Now, in these cases, the link between chips is quite long and quite lossy at Nyquist, especially as the data rates go beyond 100 gigabits per second. So signal integrity is a major challenge here and a lot of equalization is generally required which drives high power transceivers in the ASICs at either end of the link. On the other hand, the cost of the solution is very low. It's very uh, conventional fabrication technologies, um, passive cables, and the overall system, if it works, can have very low power because there's no transceivers required other than those in the ASIC at either end of the link. The key point is, can the total loss of the link be compensated? 
If it can't, then repeaters need to be introduced, also sometimes called retimers. So these are pictured here. They can be located in the connectors for the direct attached cable. This gives rise to an active, so-called active cable, or they can be inserted on the board between the ASIC and the connector. Uh, in either case, this relaxes the signal integrity requirements because now the long link is broken up into multiple shorter links, each with relaxed signal integrity requirements. This can allow the link to get to a higher data rate. On the other hand, it leads to a higher overall system cost because now you've got extra active components in the system and also a higher power consumption because these repeaters or retimers are consuming significant additional power. On the other hand, you do get a benefit in the ASIC in that simpler, less equalization, lower power transceivers can be used in the ASIC because now they don't have to drive that long passive cable. They only have to make it to the repeaters. Another alternative that's being looked at increasingly is the use of so-called flyover cables. These are cables that attach the ASIC package directly to active electrical cables or other repeaters uh, elsewhere in the system. This obviates uh, the discontinuities in the link because we no longer have to go down through the package substrate onto a conventional PCB, uh, which can give rise to uh, reflections that are damaging the signal integrity. Uh, again, here though, you've got uh, fancier packaging technology, you've got the flyover cables and the repeaters or active electrical cables. So system cost and power is higher than in the passive direct attach cable case. But again, you've got simpler and lower power transceivers in the ASIC because now these flyover cables can have reduced discontinuities and less uh, ISI that needs to be compensated. Going further, you can now take the longest remaining links in the signal path from one ASIC to another and replace them with optical fiber. Now you can make these links very, very long. Rather than being limited to say 10 meters or less, you can now make these links uh, hundreds of meters, even kilometers in length. So the signal integrity over the long links is greatly simplified. But the optical transceivers at either end require yet more uh, active components. Now you require some lasers and photodiodes. These all add extra cost and power consumption. Relatively simple low power transceivers can still be used in the ASIC because again, they only need to make it to the optical transceivers. And the big benefit here is now, once you're in optics, the reach is greatly extended again these boards can now be hundreds of meters or even kilometers apart. This is important for a particularly large uh, parallel compute data center type uh, installations. Optically interconnected systems today generally place the optical transceivers at the edge of each circuit board. The optoelectronic transceivers are housed in modules that plug into standardized connectors and can therefore be readily replaced in many cases without even powering the system down. You may be familiar with acronyms like SFP, QSFP, OSFP. Those refer to the standardized form factors of these optical modules. Such so-called pluggable optics have served the industry very well. But notice that the link from the ASIC to the optic still has to traverse the ASIC package and either a PCB trace or a flyover cable, connectors, and more packaging in the module. So as we move to 200 gigabit per second links, that link is still difficult to equalize. On the other hand, adding a few extra centimeters to the optical link is not likely to make much difference to its signal integrity. So it's natural to consider moving the optoelectronic transceivers closer to the ASIC. When we place them on the board, such integrated transceivers, also known as optical engines, are referred to as onboard optics, OBO, or near package optics, NPO depending on how miniaturized and how close to the ASIC they're arranged. But there's increasingly a trend to avoid the worst packaging discontinuities altogether and put the optical transceivers right in the same package as the ASIC, resulting in co-packaged optics or CPO. Obviously, there's a lot of complex trade-offs being made as we go back and forth between these options, between overall power consumption, signal integrity, 
system cost, power density, and these trade-offs are gonna dictate which of these approaches is preferred for various applications in the coming years.